there are different models to uh, calculate the thermodynamic properties of uh, mixtures. So for the limited uh, for the limited case of air with water vapor, and I say limited here in uh, in, in air quotes, uh, this is the uh, we can get away with using just the ideal gas mixing law with Dalton's interpretation of ideal mixing. So um, let's see. Oh yeah, okay. So I'm gonna fire up a whiteboard here. There we go. Okay, so it would be really cumbersome to use any uh, any mixture model, uh, but it turns out that so in our limited, so in our limited, and I put air quotes here. So in our limited uh, limited cases, so temperature is less than about sixty degrees Celsius, and pressure is roughly one atmosphere. It turns out we can do ideal gas uh, slash Dalton. And what does that say again? So let's remind ourselves, so if I have a box, there is, in which I have air and water vapor, there's air everywhere. And there's also water everywhere. So another way to say that within this box, uh, the temperature of the box, the temperature of the system, of the gas inside the box, it's the temperature of the air, and it's also the temperature of the water. They're in thermal equilibrium. Um, they occupy, each component occupies the whole space. So the volume of the system is equal to the volume of the air, and it's also equal to the volume of the water. Um, and then the total pressure inside the box, it's equal to, when I look at the, if I combine ideal gas law with equal volumes, then I get that this is equal to the pressure of the air plus the pressure of the water vapor. So this is what we call the partial pressures. Partial pressures. There we go. Okay. Um, so if there's if there's zero moisture, well, I should add. So within my box here, I have well, mass is conserved as usual. Uh, or the definition of a system, if I have a closed system, then the total mass inside the box is equal to the mass of the air plus the mass of the water vapor. Okay, and I kept putting uh, air quotes there around our, our limited case because temperature less than 60 degrees and a pressure around one atmosphere, well, that's basically all of the air on planet Earth, right? It's, it's all, well, except the one that we bottle you know, for scuba diving and so on. But aside from that, you know, all of the air that we interact with on a daily basis and that we breathe, it's pretty much less than 60 and around one atmosphere. So unless you're on the space station uh, or if you're superhuman and you, you put yourself, your head into an oven, uh, you're, you're dealing with this case. Okay, so a, couple, a bit of terminology. So if there is no water vapor, well, uh, uh, so if there's no water vapor, if the mass of the water is equal to zero, then we talk about dry air. And if the mass of the water is not zero, so if it's greater than zero, because you can't have negative mass, then we talk about moist air, which is usually what we encounter. Dry air, you kind of have to manufacture it. Like you have to remove the moisture out of it. Okay, well, how wet is wet? So we quantify the amount of, or how moist is moist. So we quantify, we quantify moisture. So we quantify moisture with, we're gonna do this two ways. So we quantify it with omega, the humidity ratio. The humidity ratio. This is equal to the mass of the water divided by the mass of the air. Note this is not the total mass. Oh, sorry, I just have to get my notes back here. I am cheating, well, I'm not cheating. I am following notes there. Okay, 
Um, let's see. So this is very useful. So omega, the humidity ratio, it's really useful in calculation. We're going to use it all the time, but it's not very physically intuitive because we know you can't add an infinite amount of, uh, you cannot add an infinite amount of uh, water vapor inside air. At some point, it saturates and then it, it condenses, right? It, it sticks to the surfaces as a liquid or just falls to the ground and it's raining. So there's a maximum, there is a maximum omega. And well, we would like to, we would like to quantify this. Um, well, so first let's ask ourselves, so why is it that there is a maximum? So why is there a max? Well, let's just sketch out our, uh, our vapor dome or water for water. So I'm going to do this in the TV plane. There's V, there's T. So there's the, there's my sketched out vapor dome. And I'm doing, I'm going to draw a couple isobars, a few isobars. There you go. So these are constant pressure lines. Whoop, it's a little bit crooked there, but that's okay. Okay. Like this. All right. So in the air right now, there is some water vapor. And it's at some condition. So the water vapor, remember that we're doing this as an ideal gas. So the water vapor inside the room, it doesn't even know that there is air around there. So the water vapor is just floating about and it's going, oh, I'm just water vapor, I'm just water vapor. And it thinks that it's at whatever its partial pressure is. So it exists at a state. So the water vapor is, let's say over here, right? On the, on the gas side of the vapor dome. And that point is at pH two O and T. This is the state of the water vapor inside the mixture. So if I stay at constant uh, temperature, yes. So if I don't change the temperature of the room, but I just keep dumping in more and more water, maybe I've got a big vat of water that evaporates, and then it's constantly adding moisture to the air, but the temperature is constant. And I'm going to stay on a horizontal line and eventually, bam, I'm going to hit the vapor dome and there it starts condensing. And then liquid is either going to find, find uh, the coldest surface so, so that the coldest surface inside the room, there's some, there's some water, that, the water droplets that are going to condense on that surface. This is what happens in your house in the winter. You'll see a little bit of water, uh, liquid water on the windows. This is where the, the water vapor condenses if your house is too humid. Uh, or it's just going to fall to the ground. If there's no nucleation point, I would say. So if there's no point where the water can form a droplet, then it's just going to, they're going to form in midair if there are no walls, and then it'll just fall down or it'll form around like a, a speck of dust or something. So this is the maximum. This is the maximum. This is the saturation point. So in this direction here, this is plus H2O. We're adding water vapor going towards the vapor dome. And so here the pressure uh, is, so remember in the, um, in our uh, TV plane, in this direction, this is increasing pressure. These isobars are of increasing pressure. So that means that as I'm adding water at constant temperature, we're actually increasing, this is why we're moving left, we're increasing the partial pressure of the water until we hit the vapor dome. And at this point, I am at the saturation pressure. And then it condenses. So there's a maximum amount of water that I can have, which is the amount of mass that I would have, which corresponds to a partial pressure equals to its saturation pressure. So we're going to define the second measure of moistness or of humidity, phi. This is relative humidity. This is equal to the pressure of the waters. We'll say the uh, yeah, P, you could say pH2O currently inside the mixture divided by the saturation pressure of water at whatever temperature my mixture is at. 
Uh, so right now it's roughly 20 degrees Celsius uh, inside the house. Well, I didn't here. I'm going to, I'm going to stop this share. Oh, and I closed your notes. I'm going to go in. Put this me in. Here, I'm going to go in and reopen. I'm going to go and open your notes. So I'm going to go and open the tables. So I realize all you're seeing is my face right now. I'm just going to fetch the tables. Table, 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 tables. There we go. So let me just share the screen. So I'm just going to go to my saturation. Saturated water table temperature. So at 20 degrees Celsius, the saturation pressure is 2.339 kPa. And so when the partial pressure of water inside the room reaches 2.339 kPa, then that is it. That's all of the that's all of the um, that's all of the what am I trying to say? That's all of the water that you can put inside the air. You can never have yeah, that's it. That's all the moisture you can put inside the air. Okay. Well, how are these related? So let me go back to our whiteboard. So how are uh, how are omega the humidity ratio and phi the relative humidity? How are these two related? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and clear all the drawings. So omega is equal to the mass of water, mass of water vapor, divided by the mass of the air. And now I said, I'm assuming everything is an ideal gas. I'm going to assume that the water is an ideal gas as well. It's water vapor, after all. So the water is an ideal gas. So that means that the partial pressure, it follows PV is equal to MRT. So PV over RH2OT over... P in the air follows the ideal gas law as well. So PV over R air T. All right. So the air and the water vapor at the same temperature. I'm going to get rid of these two. They occupy the whole volume. I'm going to get rid of the volumes. And the R air, I'm going to get on the top. So I get R air over R H2O times P H2O. This is the water, the partial pressure of water divided by the pressure of the air. Notice now this is not the this is not the actual pressure inside the room. It's the partial pressure in the air. Well we're actually going to get rid of this. So this is um, this is going to be equal to R air over R H two O multiplied by pressure of the partial pressure of water divided by well, the, there's only two components, there's air and water vapor. So the partial pressure of the air is just the total pressure inside the fluid, minus the partial pressure of the water. Yes. Okay, but then we've said that from the definition of uh, phi, then we know this is the let's see the partial pressure of the water is just phi times the saturation pressure. R water. So it's going to be phi times P sat at whatever temperature I'm at, divided by the pressure minus phi times P sat. And this here, this looks like a weird number, but it's a constant. Specific R of air divided by the specific R of water. Well, the specific R of anything is just the universal value of R divided by the molar mass of air over the specific, the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of water. So this is universal constant. So this becomes the molar mass of the water over the molar mass of air. So this is equal to 
size 18 grams per mole divided by air is about 28.8 something 84 grams per mole so this turns out to be 0 0.622 it's the accepted value so i can write omega is 0 0.622 phi p sat of t the saturation pressure is uh, a value it's a function of temperature over the pressure minus phi p sat of t there we go so if i know so if i know temperature pressure and phi then we can get omega this is a linear equation we can go backwards so we can turn this around i'm going to get p minus phi times p sat here i'm going to drop the t but the, the p sat is a function of temperature times omega is equal to 0 0.6225 psat. Uh, let's see, it's going to be p omega is equal to 5 psat omega plus 0 0.6225 psat. And I'm going to isolate for phi so that I get phi is equal to pressure divided by the saturation pressure at the temperature multiplied by omega over 0 0.622 plus omega. Oops. This. Okay. So if I know T, P, omega, I can get phi. Awesome. Okay. Now there's a good question. Uh, how would I even get, well, if I know temperature, pressure, and phi, then I can get omega. If I know temperature, pressure, and omega, I can get phi, but I don't know how to measure phi or omega. Turns out these are actually relatively, well, nowadays they're relatively easy to measure, but uh, they used to be relatively, relatively hard to measure because there's not, uh, it was not a good, uh, a good, like, uh, phi measure or omega measure. You, you have to derive something else, which is, which is a little bit cumbersome. So how do we measure either one of these? So how to measure this? Aha, that's a good question. So let's devise a means to measure the value of phi or omega. Um, let me clear the drawings. So we're going to use a thought experiment. Nobody does this in practice, but this would work. So I'm going to have a really long trough with a water bath. Like that, and then... There's a water bath, so there's water in here. And then I've got an automatic valve and I'm flowing in liquid water here to replenish it because there's water going out, it's evaporating into the stream of moist air. So here is, this is state one, incoming state. This is state two, going out. So coming in, I have air coming in uh, at state one. I have a certain amount of air coming in. I have a certain amount of water vapor coming out. I'm going to say m.w, water vapor coming in at state one, and it's at T1 and P. I'm going to assume this is a constant pressure. So it's the same pressure at the end. Um, so that means it's at a certain omega one, a certain humidity ratio or a certain phi one but I, I don't know either one of these two things. But I'm going to flow it over this ridiculously long water bath until it's fully humid. So it's going to come out at a certain pressure. It's going to come out at T2, which I can measure. I can just stick a thermometer in there, get the get the temperature of the the temperature of the, the stream of air coming out. Um, and now I know it's actually at phi 2 is equal to 1. 
by experimental design. Basically, I'm going to keep making troughs that are longer and longer and longer until I see no change in T2. And I'll say, ah, okay, now it's fully humid. There's no more air eva evaporating into this, but there's no more additional air evaporating into this. You can tell it's a really cumbersome experiment. Um, all right. Well, I can analyze the system. So I'm going to draw a system here. I'm going to switch color. So this is an open system. Here's the boundary of my system. Here I'm going to close the boundary. There we go. And now I can analyze this. Okay, conservation of mass. The molecules aren't changing into one thing or another, right? If something comes into the control volume as air, it exits as air, as air. And if it comes in as water, it exits as water. It could be liquid water, it could be gaseous water, but it's all water, it's the same molecules. So air is conserved, the mass of air is conserved. So the amount of air coming in at one has to be equal to the amount of air going out at two because there's only one inlet and one outlet of air. So I'm just gonna call that M dot air. So this is the air mass conservation. Okay. There's some water vapor coming in at one, plus there's some liquid water coming in. That has to be equal, there's only one outlet that carries water vapor. Well, there's only one outlet at all. So the mass of water coming out at two has to be equal to these two things. This is the water mass conservation. I'm just going to rewrite this. I'm going to say that the mass of the liquid coming in is equal to m dot water vapor at two minus m dot water vapor at one. Yeah, basically, if water evaporates, if I want the water level to stay constant, then I have to replenish my water level. Then I'm going to write conservation of energy. I mean, the system with dynamics after all. So if we have an open system, what do we do? We write conservation laws. So conservation of energy, or the first law, is going to tell me you're going to write the first laws, the same first law as it always was. So DDT is equal to Q dot in minus W dot out plus, and then I have the inlets. So at inlet one, I have m dot air coming in at h, the enthalpy of the air at one, plus I have some water vapor coming in at one, at whatever the enthalpy of the water is at state one. Plus I have a certain amount of liquid water coming in at the enthalpy of the water liquid. And exiting, I have a certain amount of air, the same amount of air coming out enthalpy H air at state two minus water vapor coming out at two with an enthalpy, water enthalpy two, like this. Okay, well, it's steady, Let me get rid of this. It's, I'm gonna insulate this, I'm gonna put foam everywhere around the experiment so there's no heat transfer and there is no shaft, no nothing, so there's no work being done. So this is all equal to zero and then I'm gonna collect some like terms so m dot air, m dot air, I'm going to take these two terms, going to put them together. I'm going to have an m dot air, enthalpy of the air at one minus the enthalpy of the air at two. Um, here, m dot liquid, I can replace that with m dot water at two minus m dot water at one. So then I can put in a term which is going to be plus m dot water at one multiplied by enthalpy of the water at one minus the enthalpy of the liquid water. And then I have the m dot w so plus m dot water coming out at two. And then I have, so I took take care of this particular, uh, particular term. So m dot water f2, I'm going to have an enthalpy of the liquid water minus enthalpy of the gaseous water at 2. And this is all equal to 0. 
Okay. Where am I? Yeah. So now, um, well, this one here is easy. Air is an ideal gas. And for an ideal gas, I know that uh, delta H is equal to, for perfect gas, it's CP delta T. So this is M dot air CP T1 minus T2. Plus, aha, M dot water at 1. This is the humidity ratio at 1 multiplied by M dot air multiplied by the enthalpy of the water at state 1 of the water vapor minus the enthalpy of the liquid water going into the system and plus m dot w2 is going to be the same thing omega 2 the humidity ratio at 2 m dot air multiplied by the enthalpy of the liquid water minus the enthalpy of the water vapor at state 2 this is zero okay so i can cross out all of these m dot airs Ooh, the flow rate of air doesn't actually matter for my measurement. Interesting. Um, let's see. So I don't, okay. Uh, where are we at? Well, uh, I want omega one. This is, this is actually my, this is what I'm really after. Is the state what I'm I'm designing this experiment in order to gain insight into what's the actual state of the mixture coming in. So I'm going to solve for omega one is equal to. Let's see. It's going to be equal to CP T two minus T one. This is this first term. I just took it onto the other side. I'm going to have a plus omega two. Enthalpy of the water vapor at state two minus the enthalpy of the water in liquid form. And then I'm going to divide by this term here, enthalpy of the water at one minus the enthalpy of the liquid water, like that. Okay, here, let me make just a bit of room because we're not quite done. We've got to make a couple, I don't need these anymore. I've got to make a few assumptions more. I'm just going to make a bit of room like this. Okay, this should be enough. So a few last assumptions. Um, we're going to assume that the water vapor so the water vapor at two is at the saturated vapor state. Or I should say has saturated vapor enthalpy. So that is enthalpy of the water at two is going to be equal to the HG at T2. We're going to assume, likewise, that the water vapor at 1, H has H is equal to HG at T1. And then I'm going to assume that the liquid water is at T2. So that the enthalpy of the liquid water is going to be equal to HF at T2. So here, this is at T2. Okay. So if I plug this in, then I get omega 1 is equal to CP of air, T2 minus T1, plus omega 2. Well, this is HW at 2. This is HG at 2 minus HF at 2. This is HFG at T2. So 
divided by hg at t1 minus hf at t2. So the bottom is not hfg. Okay. And then you'll say, oh, well, but I need to know omega 2. I need to measure an omega. I'm stuck. But you're not. Because, well, we don't know what the value of omega 2 is from the get go. But we are now smart enough that we've related omega and phi. And we've designed our experiment carefully so that the uh, the humidity, the relative humidity at state two is one. Aha. So if the relative humidity is one, then I can use the equation that relates these two things. I know that omega two is going to be equal to, uh, what was it again? I'm going to make sure I don't have an error. So now I know that omega two is equal to 0 0.622. And it's going to be phi two p sat at t2 over p minus phi 2 p sat at t2. But I know these are 1. So that's just equal to 0 0.622 p sat at t2 over p minus p sat at t2. That's it. So if I measure p, T2, then I measure P, T2. I can go into the tables, get P sat. I know omega 2. I can go into the tables. I can get HFG at T2. I can get uh, HF at T2. And now I need T1. So if I measure T1, so if I measure those three things, P, T2, T1, then I can get omega 1. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. Um, a bit of terminology. So T1 and T2, we call these, they are called the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperatures. So T1 is the dry bulb, T2 is the wet bulb temperature. Why is it that we call them that? Well, that's a very interesting question. I'm glad you would ask. Here, let me go to share our desktop two. So we call them the wet and dry bulb because we don't actually build a huge long trough in order to humidify the air. What we do is we get a thermometer like this, and then we have. So over here, there's a there's a bulb, there's a there's a thermometer, and the bulb of the thermometer here is dry. There's nothing on it. It's just it's a normal thermometer. So the dry bulb temperature is just T. It's just the temperature of the air. It's of the water mixture of the air and the water vapor. It's a temperature, it's the actual thermodynamic temperature of the moist air. The wet bulb, what we do is we put we put some water and then there's a wick. There's a little piece of cloth there that takes the water. And by capillarity, it surrounds. The other bulb is right here. That's the wet bulb. So through capillarity, the, the air over here is fully wet because that water evaporates constantly. You have to keep coming in and, and replenishing this little bit so that the air surrounding that bulb is kept at 100% relative humidity all the time. And through evaporative cooling, it loses some temperature. So the, the wet bulb temperature is typically, if this is the dry bulb, the wet bulb temperature would be a bit lower. Let's say it's over here. And this is the wet bulb temperature. This is my T2. This is my T1. Aha. Awesome. You may have seen, um, this is a, a uh, we usually show it in the chemistry courses. You may have seen these things called a sling psychrometer. Here's a very, they're usually a bit more fancy than this. This is a demonstration version. So in order to accelerate the process, we have, here is my wick. So what I do is I get a bit of water and I humidify it. Here's the dry bulb. And then I take them in my hands and I go, and I spin them like this to accelerate the evaporative cooling so that I will get the dry bulb temperature and then the wet bulb temperature here. 
and that allows me to go onto with my equations and then I punch in like a furious madman and then I look up my temperature saturated uh, temperature saturated water uh, table and then I look this up and then I punch in and I say ah the relative humidity is this much well um, because this is for a specific pressure where is oh did I lose my here this I don't need this anymore uh, so because this is for a, a specific pressure, oh, yes, I've opened it on a different, there we go. Because it's for a specific pressure, so what we do or what we use is something which we call the psychrometric chart. So the psychrometric chart is a really, really nifty uh, nifty chart. It looks completely overwhelming, but it's not. It's just that it's a, this is a two-dimensional, so it has these axes crossing each other. That's because it's a two-dimensional, it's a two-dimensional table in graphical form. On the x-axis here, you have the dry bulb temperature, your normal temperature. So if right now at my house, it's 20 degrees Celsius, let's say, then I know that the state of my air is somewhere on is 20 degrees Celsius line. Wow. This is how this is supposed to be a straight line. And anyway, I'm somewhere in this line. Nope, not that line. Okay. You get my I'm gonna dash it so I can actually kind of follow. Okay, I can't draw straight anymore. I'm somewhere in this 20 degrees line. Okay. Um, you have these thick red line on this particular chart. They all look a little bit different. I have these thick red lines there. Those are lines of constant humidity. So here, let me clear the drawing. So if I'm at 20 degrees Celsius, I'm on this vertical line, and I know it's about 45 45% uh, relative humidity in my basement. So I would go up until this vertical line crosses the 40, 50, so halfway, so it's roughly here. This is the 45%. So this point here, this is the thermodynamic state of, uh, this is the thermodynamic state of the air inside my basement right now. Okay, so if I want to know other properties, if I want to know the wet bulb, then I can just follow. So here we have, you see here, TWB, T wet bulb equals constant. That's the axis, that's the direction of that axis. It's roughly constant to enthalpy. We're going to talk about enthalpy in a minute. So we can follow this line. So I can follow this back up. It's these thin lines like this. I can come back up and then up until I hit this. Actually, they are the, the wet bulb temperatures are written on this curved axis here. So that means if I were to, uh, I would, if I were to make the stupid measurement there, I would be expecting 10, 11, 12, like, 13 degrees wet bulb temperature. I can follow horizontal axis. You'll see here we have the, uh, out here, something called the dew point. We'll explain what that is. And out here I have the humidity ratio. And this is a bit weird. This is grams of moisture. So grams of water per kilogram of dry air. So I'm gonna follow to the right. So out here. So that means that the value of omega is on the inside axis, it's six, Seven, it's like 6.6, .6. you'd have to go and measure it, but like 6.6 .6 grams of uh, water per kilogram of dry air. So that's the humidity ratio. Uh, I could get, I have the vapor pressure here. I can just continue this line horizontally. And the vapor pressure is 7.75 millimeters of mercury. Awesome unit. Uh, we have these this other slant here I can follow. So these, so slanted slightly down and to the right, these are lines of constant V or constant specific volume. So that means I'm just in between, uh, let's see, 0. 0.84, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'm just next to 0. 0.84, there's 0. 0.8283, so it's almost 0. 0.84 grams, uh, let's see. 
cubic meter per kilogram. So meter cubed per kilogram of dry air. Very important. We scale everything with respect to dry air. So not with the total mass, but with, with just with the air mass that is inside this system. Um, so this is if I know the dry bulb and the humidity. If I know, let's say, the dry bulb and the wet bulb. So if I'm at 20 degrees dry bulb temperature and 10 degrees wet bulb temperature, then I'm going to look at, so my 10 degrees wet bulb is along this line. I'm going to go down until I hit the 20s. I'm somewhere in this line until I hit the 20 degrees Celsius. It's right here. So this is the thermodynamic state of my mixture. That means 10 degrees wet bulb, 20 degrees dry bulb is 27% uh, relative humidity or a humidity ratio of just under four, just about four grams per kilogram of dry air. So you can imagine because the other way, if I know the dry bulb temperature and the humidity ratio, then I can work out what phi is and the wet bulb and so on. Um, there are two things I want to talk about more about this chart. So number one is enthalpy. And number two is the dew point. So enthalpy is actually enthalpy is enthalpy. But I just want to um, point out that this is just like for the specific volume uh, for the humidity ratio, everything is scaled per dry air per mass of dry air. So the enthalpy is in kilojoules, this, this is the specific enthalpy, it's in kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. So that means if I have a pipe and in it is air coming in at T1 is equal to 20 degrees Celsius. And uh, what is it? Uh, phi one of 40%. And there's two, I don't know, 10 kilograms per hour of dry air coming through. Mass of the air is equal to 10 kilograms per hour. It's going through this pipe. Um, let's see. Then what is the rate of enthalpy going through? It's going to be, I said 20 and 40. So 20 degrees Celsius dry bulb temperature. And I said 40% relative humidity means this is the thermodynamic state. So I'm going to come back up and the lines of constant wet bulb temperature, it's almost parallel to lines of constant enthalpy. So, you know, I want to be careful, but sometimes I can't. So I'm going to go in. So normally I would get a rule. Oh, actually, hold on. I can draw, I think I can draw a straight line. I'll draw a straight line like so. There we go. And this is 35 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. So the rate at which enthalpy is going through is, so if I wrote the, so if I'm doing something magic over here and it comes out at state two, <coughs> excuse me, and then I want to know how much whatever work or heat is going through, then I would write the EDT is equal to Q dot in minus the work out plus, and then I would have M dot air H1, which is, we said 35. So this is my 35 kilojoules per kilogram minus M dot air H2. And I don't have to write a plus there is no term that's plus m dot water at one h water. This doesn't exist. It's taken into account in this enthalpy scale. Same thing for state two. So I just count m dot air times h one, and that's all of the enthalpy coming into this system over here. Okay. Um, oh yes, the dew point. What is the dew point? Well, we kind of know. I mean, the dew point is actually, it's it's the temperature outside when there's water that collects onto 
uh, that when there's water that collects onto the leaves of the of the grass, right, the blades of grass. So let's look at our TV diagram. We're going to look at our vapor dome again. So if I have a, I'm going to draw a single constant pressure line like this. So if I start over here, boom, this is my, my current state. This is the temperature at 4 p.m. This is the temperature at 4 p.m. And this is the pressure line that corresponds to the vapor pressure, the partial pressure of water in the air. Yeah. So if the so the sun sets down, the temperature starts to cool down because there's no solar radiation anymore. So the temperature cools down, but the water vapor is still there. And the pressure stays constant. There's not like a storm coming through. It's a very still weather. So we're at constant pressure. Like the, the water is not changing. There's no there's no wind. Or there's no and there's no lake in the middle of a no lake place that is not a desert, whatever you would call that. So there's no water evaporating that's adding water, there's that's adding moisture to the air, and there's no change in pressure. There's no big weather system coming through. So you're at constant pressure, constant mass basically there's no extra mass of air coming in there's no extra mass of water coming in so we're at a constant omega so now you go down at a constant pressure boom until you hit here that temperature there that is the dew point temperature that's the temperature to which you have to cool down uh, the temperature to which you have to cool down a mass of air so that the water condenses, or basically T dew point is equal to T such that the saturation pressure or T D point dew point, I'm going to use this, is such that the saturation pressure at the dew point temperature is equal to the current partial pressure of water at T, at whatever state you're at right now. It is not equal, so this dew point temperature is not equal to, uh, it is not equal to the wet bulb temperature, not the same thing. So if I'm at 20 degrees C, 40% humidity or 45, let's say in the basement here, we're over here. If I go to the right, the dew point is five, six, we here, five, six, seven and a half, 7.5 degrees Celsius. So if I take my basement and I cool it down until 7.5 degrees Celsius, then water is gonna condense on the walls. Ah, interesting. And that's it. So now we know what this, so this is actually a really useful tool, the psychrometric chart, all of these lines and these intersections of lines are really, they're actually, it, it seems really annoying, but it's actually really powerful. Instead of using my equations over and over again to figure out what is omega, what is phi, and so on, if I'm at near one atmosphere, strictly if I'm at one atmosphere pressure, but if I'm at near one atmosphere, then I can just use this chart to work out what the state is of my thermodynamic mixture. That's it for this video.